The Deuteronomy lesson's pretty straightforward. Live this way, you get a blessing. Live this way, you're under a curse. Living against the law of God, in fact, brings curses. Living under God's authority brings blessing. My dilemma, our human dilemma, is that we like to play those sides of the fence. Uh, actually not aware at all, mostly, of uh, the spiritual consequences of being on one side or the other. And therefore we live in this kind of very tainted uh, spiritual environment that is this mixture of literally the experience of blessings and the experience of curses. Jesus, in the midst of that, invites us into a very particular kind of life. A life living under the authority of a cross. Cross-bearing, to use the classic language. Where the curse is broken because on the cross Jesus takes the curse. He bears it for himself. It does not light upon us. <clears throat> because the blood of Jesus stands in all, of the, in all opposition to the works of the devil. But to walk in the light of and under the authority of the cross is a very particular kind of life. It invites us, in fact, into a place of profound vulnerability before God, where we face up to the discontinuity that is, in fact, always present within us. I, I kind of describe cross-living as sort of joy with a jagged edge. Yes, there is profound joy because I've been found. I've been known. I've been discovered. There is someone in the universe who knows all of who I am and receives this broken vessel with great love and tenderness and kindness, pours out upon me his healing and his mercy and his forgiveness. And I never, ever have to be afraid of being shamed in his presence. If you have a picture of a God that if you stand in his presence, you are being shamed, that's not the God of who we see in Jesus. Notice. He never does that, ever. But to live that way requires something of me that I think is profoundly important. Not only is it facing up to the discontinuity, but learning to live there. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the power of God may be seen as from God and not from us. It's acknowledging the broken earthen vessel. Not, not trying to paper it over, not, not trying to sort of be fine, not trying to live in a way that is quite patently dishonest, especially among Christian brothers and sisters, about the true nature of what our life is like. There is always about us that combination of joy and jagged edge that cuts, that is not comfortable, that is a part of the death of what we bear when we bear a cross. We are, in fact, being put to death in some way, more and more, that the life of Jesus might be manifested in us more and more, which is why we're bearing a cross, not bearing an empty tomb on our back. There are things that God has yet to work in us. We will not be totally and utterly freed until we stand before him in all of the splendor of the Godhead, having shed the brokenness of this mortal body, received a resurrection body, and know perfectly the wonder and the delirious excitement of living in that kind of joy-filled life. But that's later. It's not now. Right? Right. <laughs> so that's a part of what we share in common. It is true for all of who we are as sisters and brothers in the body of Christ. 
Therefore, to be those who live under cross-bearing in part, acknowledge that. It's okay, in fact, to be that way because it is what we have in common together as sisters and brothers. It is, in fact, our appointed lot. It is not our appointed lot to be wonderful all the time. It is not our appointed lot to spend so much time on the issues of appearance in an effort to try to cover over the inner places of brokenness that in fact do exist so that I become this actor who's always putting my best foot forward because I need your approval. I want to make sure that I'm in fact actually liked, so I put on the facade. That's actually entirely contrary to cross-bearing. It's a lie. It's a lie to God. It's a lie to the body of Christ. And it's a lie to yourself, because you know it's really not true. There is wondrous freedom. And finally, in the midst of this jagged edge of joy, to be entirely and completely yourself knowing that God is working in you, as the prayer book says, better things than we could ever desire or pray for. And that is, in fact, our appointed lot. And not to live in that place of both joy, pain, and contentment with this lot is an invitation to live, in fact, in a place of shame. Where I'm always trying to cover over the things I don't want you to know because I am ashamed. Of them. But in Jesus, you see, the Lamb, there is no shame. Ever. Ever. And that's a part of what, in fact, sets me free. You see, here's where the gospel lesson stopped. It's the appointed one. I think they made a mistake. <laughs> After this, what is it profit if they gain the whole world but forfeit themselves? Which is, of course, the appointed question. Why would you ever want to do anything so foolish as that? Then he goes, those who are ashamed of me and my words, of them the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his glory. Why would he go from for the warning about why would you ever want to forfeit your life to the place of shame? Because, quite frankly, to choose not to live in this place of jagged edge of joy under the cross invites, in fact, requires living in a place where I know there's shame and so I have to get you to like me. And therefore, will I be bold about the gospel when I'm trying to always manage my appearance rather than living under the place of the cross? No, because I want you to like me. And that's far more important than me being clear about the gospel. To live in that place where I walk in fear of not wanting to be rejected not only undercuts the possibility of bold joy in Jesus, it betrays the very thing of what God has done in us. It's symptomatic of something that is entirely not right in our relationship with God and ourselves. Because to come into this jagged place of joy where we acknowledge both the joy and the pain of life, actually opens us up to a deeper place of, what's the contemporary word, authenticity, so that the true light can flow through us with, with ease. Because I don't need to impress you. I want you to be impressed with him, you see, not with me. And that's actually not a platitude, it's real. It's coming out of your deepest heart. But you can only say that because in the end, you've come so face to face with who he is and who you are that the gospel is the only safe place there is. I, I said to a colleague yesterday, you know why I believe this stuff so deeply? Because it's really all I have. It's all I have. And quite honestly, that's an extraordinary place of freedom. Do I still wrestle with wanting to keep the shame over here and the facade over here? Yeah, <laughs> of course. But I'm always reminded, as I am in these verses today, 
I don't want to live under a curse anymore. It's just that clear. And I would rather live in this broken, odd, at odds with the world, at odds with a lot of Christians I know, place of vulnerability before God and before others that the power of God might flow through and that he might be the one who draws all people to himself rather than me working so darn hard to get the applause. So, family of God, on this, the day after Ash Wednesday, as we enter into Lent together, I would urge you to think deeply, take time to examine your life and ask God to help you, even as I'm asking him to help me to come more deeply into a cross-bearing life, this jagged place of joy. Amen. 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 Amen.